In this lecture we're going to be talking about the freewheeling diode, which is a technique that is used in some rectifier circuits that have inductive loads to improve the performance of the output current. So we'll begin by taking a look at the previous example with the inductive load and we're going to see how we can use this diode to improve the output current. So let's go ahead and draw the circuit for that rectifier. So remember that for this circuit, because the output current is lagging the output voltage, then when the output voltage goes negative, D1 stays on because the output current is still positive. So one way to get around that is to add a diode in parallel with the output load. So we'll put it right here. And we'll call it D2. And let's also define the anode to cathode voltages. So we'll call this VAK1 and we'll call this VAK2. Now remember that for the previous example where we didn't have D2 when the output voltage went negative, VAK1 was negative but the output current was still positive. So that forced D1 to stay on. However, when we add this diode D2, when the output voltage goes negative, then VAK2 becomes positive and it forward biases diode D2, which means that that diode is going to turn on and therefore the output current has a path to flow that doesn't need to go through D1. So what that does is that it allows for D1 to turn off. So that's why we call this diode a freewheeling diode because the output current then is going to flow through D2, L1, and R1. So the output is kind of feeding itself. So we'll say then that we have two states for this rectifier. Let's say that state 1, D1 is on, and D2 is off. And for state 2, D1 is off and D2 is on. And so state 1 is from 0 to pi and state 2 is from pi to 2 pi. So now let's draw the input voltage and the output voltage and current to see how the circuit works. Okay, so again, the input voltage is going to be a sinusoid, so it's going to look like this. And for state 1, D1 is going to be on and D2 is going to be off. So the output voltage is going to look just like the input voltage. So it's going to look like this. Now for state 2, D2 is on, so V out is short circuited, meaning that the voltage would be 0. So it's going to look like this. And of course, it's going to repeat. So notice that we fixed the issue on the previous example where VI was going negative. Now it's just positive, zero, and positive again, just like the example with the resistive load. Now for the output current, during state 1, where D1 is on and D2 is off, the current is going to look just like the previous example with the inductive load. So it's going to be lagging the output voltage. So it's going to look like this then the output current is not going to be a sinusoid anymore. It's going to be a decaying exponential function that is dependent on the time constant of the circuit. So it's going to look more like this. Again, this would be a decaying function. So we'll say that this is of the form e to the minus t over tau where tau is the time constant of the circuit. So tau is equal to L over R. So again, from 0 to pi, this is going to look just like a sinusoid function. And then from pi until the output voltage goes positive again, the output current is going to look like a decaying exponential function. So it's going to look like this, and then it's going to repeat again.
And so notice also that we've improved the output current as well. So we've improved the output voltage because now it's not going negative. And we've also improved the output current because now it's more stretched over time and it never really reaches zero. Whereas in the previous example it did. Now just to compare this to the previous examples that we've looked at, the peak of the output voltage then is going to be V, just like we would expect. And the peak of the output current, so let's say it's this point right here, it's going to be V over Z as well. Now the output current for this example is a little distorted, so it's not going to look like a sinusoid anymore, but we've improved the rectification of it. So now let's take a look at a numerical example. Okay, so let's use the same numbers that we've used before. So we'll say that Vn is equal to 170 sine 377t volts. And we'll say that L1 is equal to 20 millihenry. And R1 is equal to 10 ohms. So just like before, we know that the impedance of the circuit is approximately 12.52 ohms. Remember that this comes from Z equals square root of R squared plus omega L squared. And so we know that the peak of the output current, so I out peak, is equal to 170 over 12.52 ohms which is equal to 13.58 amps. Now we'll calculate one more thing on this circuit, the time constant tau, which is equal to L over R. So it's equal to 20 millihenry over 10 ohms, which is equal to 0 0.002. Okay, so let's now draw the output voltage and current. So from zero to pi, D1 is on. So the output voltage is gonna look just like the input voltage and with a peak magnitude of 170 volts. And during state two, when D2 is on and D1 is off, the output voltage is zero because it's short circuited through D2. So this is going to be zero and it's going to repeat again. Now let's draw the output current. So we know that the peak of the output current is going to be at 13.58 amps. And it's going to be delayed in time with respect to the output voltage. So it's going to look sort of like this, peaking somewhere close to pi at 13.58 amps. But after pi, then D2 comes on, D1 goes off. So the output current is gonna look like a decaying exponential function. So it's gonna look like this. And then it's gonna repeat again. Now this decaying exponential function is proportional to e to the minus t over tau, so e to the minus t over 0 0.002. Now notice that the output voltage now is not affected by the size of the inductor L1, whereas in the previous example, the bigger L1 got, the worse V out got because it would go more into the negative side of it. So what that means then for this rectifier is that we can make inductor L1 as big as we need to to improve the rectification of the output current because the bigger the inductor gets, the bigger the time constant of the circuit gets. So remember that tau is equal to L over R. So the bigger the inductor, the bigger the time constant, and the flatter the decaying exponential function is going to be. So we can say that as L gets bigger, the output current will look more like this. We'll say that this is for L over R approaching infinity. So you can see that the peak is actually lower because now the impedance of the circuit is bigger but the output current is more rectified. So now if we compare this circuit to the previous example that we looked at that did not have a free willing diode, remember that the average of the output voltage for that example was approximately 49.13 volts. 
And if you notice, the output voltage for this example is just like the first example that we looked at with a resistive load only. And so the average of that was 54.23 volts. So the average of this rectifier is also going to be 54.23 volts. So by adding the free welding diode, we've improved the average of the output voltage by about 5 volts. So again, this voltage right here. And we've also improved the rectification of the output current. So, so far we've looked at how we can implement inductors to improve the output current. Next, we're going to take a look at how we can use capacitors to improve the output voltage.